Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Cal Rastiala, Director of the UCLA Burkle Center for International Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to another one of our webinars. This week, I have the pleasure of having on a uh, really impressive uh, person and good friend of ours, Karen Richardson. Karen is uh, currently working as a consultant, but she was previously Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs at the State Department and previously worked on public engagement issues in the White House, including as a senior advisor to Valerie Jarrett. Uh, this is in the Obama administration. Uh, and before that worked uh, for then Senator Obama. Uh, so she has a long history uh, with President Obama uh, in issues around public diplomacy, public affairs, public engagement. And those issues, I think, are always important, but especially now, uh, especially timely and interesting, uh, because the United States, which has long been uh, widely viewed around the world in positive terms, especially in our, in our allies, um, increasingly is not. And so the issue of how public diplomacy and our public image work uh, I think has never been really more important than today. So I'm really glad to have Karen on. We're going to um, do the usual format where I will hand the screen over to Karen momentarily. She will speak for a few minutes. She and I will have a joint conversation and then we will field questions or she will really field questions sent in by all of you. So I please urge you to do that. Use the Q&A feature uh, for your questions and I'll call through them as best I can and, and pose them and we'll be done in about an hour. So with that, um, Karen, the, uh, the mic and the screen are yours. Hi, everyone, and, and thank you for having me, Cal, and, and thank you for UCLA Berkle Center for organizing this discussion and having me um, to have a conversation with you all today. So um, I think that, um, you know, and, and as Cal mentioned, you know, I, I work in consulting, independent consulting right now, but I remain very engaged in these issues. Um, and, uh, and I was former you know, Deputy Assistant Secretary at the US Department of State in the Bureau of Public Affairs. So really excited to have a conversation about public diplomacy today and soft power and the relationship between the two. Um, so I think what I'll do is just start by talking about and defining public diplomacy and, um, and talking about it in the context of what we're, what we're seeing happening today, some of the challenges and, and such. So I'll just, um, and then also talking about it in the context of my role when I was over in the State Department. So um, just to start out by talking about public diplomacy and defining it, it's defined in a number of different ways because in some sense it's an evolving field, um, but broadly it's a term that is used to describe our government's efforts to conduct foreign policy for the purpose of promoting our national interest through sort of direct outreach to foreign publics. So essentially it's our nation's outreach to the publics. Um, and traditionally it was viewed more in a sort of state centric way sort of to describe state to state diplomacy. So um, relations and conversations between leaders of nations, um, for example, diplomats who are representing sovereign states. Um, but over time, it was sort of developed to um, be defined a little bit more expansively. Um, so more than an activity that strictly refers to just state to state diplomacy. In this view, we find it sort of moving away from this sort of state centric practice to one that is more multifaceted and that involves multiple networks and, and actors. Um, so what comes to mind in this area are subnational actors such as cities and counties and NGOs and the private sector um, and with the democratization of information and the expansiveness of information through the internet, um, that list has also grown a little bit more broadly, something we'll get um, into more detail about. And so I think you know what we've also seen is that because of the um, expansive role that we've seen non-state actors take in this regard, that um, we've sort of seen them as elevated as sort of legitimate uh, players in, in sort of our foreign affairs in some ways. So, um, and so while public diplomacy has historically in practice, you know, has, I think in terms of when it was actually defined was in the 1960s by I think the former Dean of um, Tufts School of uh, Foreign Policy. I think that um, what we can do is also like talk about how we've seen it played out um, in various contexts before the term was actually coined in the 60s. So 
you know, we've seen this happening during World War II when the US military used it to conduct most of its information and communications activities. We've seen it during the Cold War when the US Information Agency led public diplomacy efforts to combat Soviet propaganda and the spread of communism. So it is something that we've seen, you know, we saw it with our first, America's first diplomat, Thomas Jefferson um, and Benjamin Franklin and their communications efforts as well. So we've seen it in practice over, over time and over history and it's just sort of evolved um, as the world has evolved and geopolitics has, has changed in, in, in many respects. So why do we do it in the first place? It's one of our most powerful tools to conduct foreign policy. Um, you know, it's the way that we communicate what our values are to different countries and in and, and the foreign publics. Because, and how, to, and why does that even matter? I mean, when we think about how we um, advance our national security interests, how we, and how we make sure that we are forging consensus on issues that affect all of us in the global sphere, all of these things matter um, and are facilitated by the tool that is sort of public diplomacy. Um, it's a way of listening to people. I think this is in practice um, manifested itself differently through different presidential administrations. And, um, but generally it, is, it is, is a tool by which we're also able to listen to foreign publics. It's a way of building coalitions, international coalitions and forging consensus and trust. And, um, and this is especially important as our world becomes more globalized. Um, and information more democratized. So, you know, in short, you know, enhances our national security goals and influences how other countries see us, other countries see, see the United States. It's um, essential to promoting um, global understanding. I think there's hardly a international agreement or major, major milestone in diplomatic history where it did not involve some level of public diplomacy. Um, so, I am, so just to get to, to describe a little bit of what my role was over at the State Department, I worked in the Public Affairs Bureau um, that was um, headed by, uh, at first it was Doug France and then later by um, John Kirby. Um, but it, you know, the State Department is a very broad, a very kind of massive bureaucracy um, in a good sense, but it's, you know, it was all under the heading of the Under Secretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And so, and that was headed by Rich Stengel um, at the time that I was there. And the purpose of the Public Affairs Bureau is to communicate what our foreign policy was to international and domestic publics. And so I ran and led a department of public affairs specialists that was focused on communicating what our foreign policy is to domestic publics. So it was called the Office of Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs. And the intergovernmental affairs piece of that office dealt with our relationships with, who I mentioned, some national actors. Um, it is states and counties and mayors, not just in the United States, but also abroad and sort of, and I think that reflects a little bit of sort of understanding the key role that they play. Um, in foreign affairs and how it is important, at least at that time, to engage them in our diplomatic efforts. Um, and as they are uh, essentially in some ways, um, sort of many diplomats themselves, um, ambassadors for the country, so to speak, um, just sort of recognizing their role in that. So um, I think that, uh, right, I think that maybe Cal, that's a good place to stop and maybe we can sort of just have a, have a conversation about um, how it sort of maybe operated um, whichever way you want to take it, operate in the Obama administration. And, and again, you mentioned I also was working on foreign policy issues when I was over at the White House before joining the state. So, um, so happy to stop there and, and take it whichever way you'd like to. Okay, great. Thank you, Karen. And uh, maybe what we'll do, I mean, there's so many things you've raised that I want to make sure we get back to. Not least, you just mentioned in passing issues around mayors and other jurisdictions. And we happen to have the Lieutenant Governor of California uh, doing one of these, I think next week or the week after, it's coming up very soon, uh, exactly on this issue of kind of what is California's foreign policy. Uh, that's probably not a phrase she'll use, but it's, it's one I think is appropriate. And um, so I wanna make sure we talk about that, but, but just to go back to the big picture of kind of what you did at state and why mm -hmm. public diplomacy is actually an important thing. Uh, for us to have and to have a robust version of. Mm -hmm. One thing you mentioned in passing, and we put in the title, but but we should talk about a little bit is what is soft power? Uh, what do we really mm -hmm. mean? By that um, and is that something that governments can actually control? In other words, 
you know, whatever soft power might be, however we might define it, mm -hmm. is it something that's within our power or is it like charisma or something where, you know, you can try, but it's sort of like a, an innate quality. What's your take on no, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I think that, I mean, if we're sticking to the, you know, to the definition that was that was sort of coined by Joseph Nye, who we all know as, you know, soft power is just sort of described by him as the power to sort of achieve or the ability to achieve our objectives through attraction and persuasion. It's, you know, it, it is something that is crucive to um, how we conduct our foreign policy. Um, and public diplomacy has a very long history sort of as a vehicle by which we are able to sort of promote our soft power. Um, so the question is to whether it's something that's within our control. I mean, I definitely think through, um, you know, our public diplomacy efforts and the way that we interact with other countries, of course, is a way of, um, it, it is, if it's done strategically and in a way as we're communicating our values, I think that's within our control. I think where it gets a little bit um, to a place where it's beyond our control is more in how to sort of communicate that other country because as I mentioned, you know, one of the consequences of, you know, of having this rapid social media environment with this technological revolution and the explosion of the internet and people having access to information much more quickly um, and much more expansively. Um, I think that poses, you know, that gets to the, the your question about whether it's something we control. I think it makes it harder. Um, but again, it's, you know, and maybe control isn't like necessarily the right word, but it is a narrative challenge in some ways because you know, I think in public diplomacy and anything where you're talking about communications, the importance being of how you define the narrative for the country, how are we communicating what our values are and are they being sort of co-opted um, or, um, or sort of, or redefined for us in a way that we wouldn't define it ourselves. Um, so that to me, I think is a little bit of a challenge. I think it's also a little bit what you're talking about in terms of charisma um, you know, of a, of a, of a country and a leader. And I think that gets to um, also communicating what our, what we, who we are as a culture. And I think that also, you know, how people perceive us is based a lot on what they view our culture as. I mean, I think that when we talk about cultural diplomacy, we're talking about the arts, we're talking, and you, you know, wrote a great article about this recently is the influence of the arts and media and entertainment and how that's impacted how people see us as well as an element of our soft power. So there are multiple facets to this, but I think that um, some of it is driven in terms of talking about whether we can, um, what the influence, uh, what the influences of all of these sort of different things come into play about how it, how it impacts whether our, how our, we're projecting the soft power and using that. So oh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, that, that just makes sense. I wanna get into some specifics about what you did and what the Trump administration okay. does differently and so forth. Um, but just on that point, it is interesting that, um, you know, other countries, I think, aspire to have the kind of soft power that the United States has traditionally had. Yeah. And seem particularly good at uh, attracting other countries in that way and our cult, whether yeah. our government is something that people are drawn to and the policies of the government is a different issue, though sometimes they are, um, they're certainly yeah. attracted to American culture. Um, and so that always feels like it's been this kind of extra superpower we've had uh, mm -hmm. as a superpower, we've been able to, to leverage that. So, um, so I want to turn to what the Trump administration is doing um, and then maybe yeah. go back to what you did in your time. Um, but, you know, given how different the Trump administration is from the Obama administration, I can't imagine yeah. there's one that you see there in a positive light, but have they done anything right in the public diplomacy space? Can you point to anything you're happy about? Um, so I think that, um, I think it's, I think it's a challenge because I think what we've seen with the Trump administration is sort of a departure from how the United States in modern times has approached public, approached diplomacy. And particularly from the time when I was working at the State Department, I think, you know, when you look at how public diplomacy and diplomacy and how we've conducted our foreign policy, um, you know, with all of our post Cold War presidents from both President Bush's and Obama and Clinton, um, there was like a general, I think, set of principles by which we conducted foreign policy. They weren't all united in their beliefs in terms of 
unilateralism and multilateralism, but there was kind of a guiding force of principles that they stuck to within those sort of parameters. I think, you know, what we've seen with this administration is definitely a sort of a full-scale departure a little bit from that. And, you know, the idea of building relationships with our allies that are based on sort of mutual respect and shared responsibility. And of course, in practice is sort of varied from administration, but I think that goes back to what I was talking about in terms of there being a sort of general understanding even through different um, presidential administrations. But, and so I think what we've sort of come to with the Trump administration is, is a little bit different from that. I think, um, you know, not only have we sort of, I think, appeared to not be listening to, um, to foreign publics, but I think that, you know, people might also see us have been retreated from the world stage. So, I mean, there, there are a number of things that I think have sort of taken place in this administration, and I think it makes it, again, that sort of underscores this. Um, I think that, you know, for, and, and also, like, I think that they, you know, as Obama did when he sort of first came on, you know, to this, to the, you know, when he first assumed in his inaugural address, if you looked at the way that he approached it, I think it signaled how he was going to approach um, his foreign policy. It's about standing a hand. It's about working with, uh, it's about working with our allies and building trust amongst each other. And it's also about talking to foreign publics and it goes back to public diplomacy. And I think, you know, when he, in one signature speech, I always think about is, um, his speech to the Muslim world in Cairo, where was the speech about the new beginning. And I think that really is a reflection of how he viewed how that was going to work under Obama. It's like, how do we communicate to Muslim worlds, to, 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 to them that we are, you know, that we are in this fight, we are not your enemy, we are extending an arm. I mean, those types of things. And it also talking to the people of that country. So it wasn't just him talking to the leaders, it was talking to the people because as we've seen over time as well in, a, in other contexts and then also, you know, when he talks to, you know, he did the Young African Leaders Summits and he went around the world and talking to young people because he understands and from his viewpoint, the young people are sort of the future of not just our nation, but the nations of the world. So it was important to talk to them as the next generation of leaders. Um, I think in contrast with this administration, I think that, um, and also, you know, when you look at um, President Trump's speech at, at the UN General Assembly, and he's, you know, he sort of frames it that the globalists, you know, don't matter about the leaders and, and those types of things. So, um, I think it is, it is it is very differently done in this administration. I think that, um, you know, in terms of, of of alliances, I think there are a number of things that we've seen, you know, um, sort of him pull out from as well that I think is a signal of, of of where he sort of thinks about soft power and diplomacy and the power of alliances. I mean, I think if we're looking at him pulling out of the Trans Trans Pacific Partnership or the Paris Climate Agreement or the Open Skies Treaty or the UN Human Rights Council. So there are a number of things that showcase that his approach to multilateralism and the use of that is, is it's quite different. Um, and then I just think it's about how you're um, even talking to some of our allies, our longest allies. I mean, I think just, you know, of creating a situation where, you know, Europe <laughs> is, is one of our closest allies and has been is just referring to them in different terms is, is the foe or the enemy. And, you know, so it's, um, so it's, it is, it is, it is challenging and it's very sort of different, um, different than how we approached it for sure. And I think um, in, in sort of, we've seen in other administrations in modern times. So, um, so that's sort of my, my take on, on the differences, I think, between President Obama's um, uh, approach to this as, 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 as compared to this president. Um, and then lastly, but I'll say just in terms of the things that I was working on specifically, I mean, there were a number of things that I worked on at the State Department, both, um, and then one was just, you know, mentioning um, sort of the new relationship with Cuba and, and that relationship and normalizing relations with Cuba and watching that process. Of course, the Paris Climate Agreement as well, working on it from the public affairs perspective and inside of there. And, and also, again, I mentioned that you know, part of what I did was also manage our relationships with our subnational, um, our subnational leaders as well, and working with, um, you know, our mayor here in LA, um, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who, um, who's been a leader on this and has, um, and, and sort of worked to sort of build coalitions around supporting um, sort of the Paris Climate Agreement, um, then and actually now as well. So, um, so I'll stop there if you have any, you know, if you have any other questions specifically about that. But 
Um, but I was really fortunate, I think, to sort of been involved in some of the key things that we were working on and counting violent extremism as one of there as well. Um, and, and watching how that sort of manifests itself um, during that time. Great, great. So I do want to come back to some of that. And just to say in your comparison with Obama and Trump, you know, you were very diplomatic about it. It is a, a stark contrast. And, <laughs> you know, I think the important thing to recognize is Trump's approach is a, you said this, but it is a major deviation from what has been traditionally a bipartisan yes. view that uh, alliances are important, that multilateralism is important. And obviously there's always been a partisan kind of difference about the degree to which we might be interested yeah. in working through, let's say the United Nations versus something more unilateral. That's certainly a longstanding difference between Republicans and Democrats, um, but Trump has taken it to a different level. And you know, even in his own, it's interesting to think about them as people. Um, you know, Trump, when he talks about the way that other nations might look to us, he tends to talk about it in terms of respect, mm -hmm. um, not attraction. I mean, presidents typically don't. Um, but you know, in his own personal life, as far as most people can tell, Trump doesn't really have friends. That's not a concept that he seems to really mm -hmm. gravitate to. There are people he works with. He intimidates people. He attracts people. Maybe certain people. Um, but, you know, kind of he's very transactional by his sort of own admission. And certainly that's, you know, that's a cliche about him at this point. Whereas, um, you know, I think of President Obama, you know him vastly better, um, somewhat aloof personally, um, but certainly someone who does have a lot of friends and really understands basic human nature. Maybe he's not um, Bill Clinton in his desire to befriend everybody in the room, but he's, um, you know, he's just very different. And so Trump is just a deviation from what we've traditionally seen in political figures. And that carries over into his whole approach to dealing with foreign leaders. Um, so in any event, there's a lot we could say. I don't want to psychoanalyze. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's right though, Cal. I mean, I think, you know, just on a very human level, I think that, and, you, and I think in some ways you're talking about like how our own personal like personalities manifest itself in our leadership, right? So how you sort of see him acting on in an individual basis is how he sort of conducts his affairs of the, with the affairs and the leaders of the world. So it's not, you know, so 100%, I think it's reflective of, of their personalities. Um, and I think that's just a, it's just one of the things that we take in consideration when we elect our leaders is how we see them interacting in, in different contexts, because it's not that different um, as it sort of, you know, reflects a little bit of their personality. And one thing I will say in terms of also just going back to some, some of the signals about um, where I think the Trump administration was going to go and in their view about soft power and public diplomacy, I think out the gate was their their State Department budget that they that they presented to Congress. I mean, they've, it's a little bit like Groundhog's Day because every year they submit a budget that is basically, you know, geared toward the hollowing out of the State Department. Um, but I think that it just sort of signals that they had very little interest in soft power and just wanting, I mean, in fact, I think his budget director, um, Nick Mulvaney was mentioned, you know, here's our hard, hard power budget. So I think just right out the gate that sets up the, what the priorities are for them. It's the militarization, to borrow from a colleague, the militarization of everything. But then, you know, and I think, and ironically about that is that even when you had the military, you know, he appointed generals in power, he also didn't really listen to them that much too. So, um, but I think that just, you know, just itself looking at what they are proposing for the State Department um, is was a real signal about what their value was in terms of how they see um, the efficacy of soft power and public diplomacy. It's very hard to do to, to, to do either one of those things um, when state is on a starvation diet of sorts, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think unfortunately the State Department has been underfunded for a long time. And yes. even within the Pentagon, many people within the Pentagon for years have said, look, you know, we have this enormous budget. We can only do so much. You know, we kind of have one set of tools. State should have a bigger slice, but we traditionally mm -hmm. don't do that. And Trump took that to an extreme. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the idea, I mean, the reorganization of the State Department, you know, the, some of these things isn't unique. It's gone back and forth. It's like reorganizing the State Department, trying to find efficiencies in the system and in the budget. I think, and that's also probably like a healthy thing. I think just going back to what you said, it is, it is the scale about, it's the scale at which and how different that is. It's just, you know, and I think, you know, the defense, the defense community will, will also say and support this is that you can't have a strong national security 
and a strong Department of Defense with a weak State Department and USAID. So just combining, you know, we are at our best when we are combining our soft and our hard power tools. And um, and most and, and many times I feel like that's framed as an either or situation. It's either soft power or hard power in the mil you're either for the military or you're not. But I think that, you know, those in the, you know, in the defense community will be the first ones to say that, you know, if we don't develop, if we don't invest in our soft power and our diplomacy and our public diplomacy efforts, then we're going to have to spend more on our military. And I think General Mattis was the one who said, well, if you're not going to fund the State Department, I'm going to need more bullets, something like that. So we're going to need more to buy more ammunition. Absolutely. And it is, you know, it is interesting that even if you take, and there is a longstanding debate over hard power versus soft power and mm -hmm. soft power. Nebulous. And, and again, maybe Republicans tend to lean more hard power. Um, but even so, normally you would say, well, your hard power is magnified when you have a group of allies willing to wield it around you. So in other words, like going it alone mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the best approach. Even if you take a kind of hard power approach to the world, you still would want to have alliances that would multiply your abilities. And what's odd about Trump and what I don't understand about the strategy, if there is one, um, is the consistent alienation of so many of our longest allies, as you mentioned in your opening remarks. Um, but I wanna make sure before we run out of time, there's two really mm -hmm. interesting things that have come up that I wanna make sure we get to. So one is the issue of, um, of other jurisdictions within the US, cities and states. I wanna mm -hmm. turn to that right now and then also ask you about social media and how mm -hmm. technology has changed the way we yeah. uh, public diplomacy because you, you, know, you interestingly pointed out, we're talking about the Cairo speech that the president at the time, President Obama, was very much speaking to the people or trying to reach the people uh, you know, of the, let's say, the Middle Eastern world, not just the leaders. And if you take the really big sweep of looking at how diplomacy has evolved over, let's say, you know, a century, uh, it wasn't really that easy to speak to the people in any country mm -hmm. years ago. Today, it's incredibly easy. Um, so it's created this totally different dynamic. But let's yeah. start with the question about states and cities. So mm -hmm. you mentioned um, our own mayor, uh, Eric Garcetti. I brought up earlier the lieutenant governor. Certainly California is not the only uh, place where there's a pretty robust set of international engagements outside of Washington. Um, does that complicate things from the point of view of the State Department? Is it a good thing? How do you see that? Karen? Um, okay, I hope right. you can hear me. Can you, yeah, yeah can right, you hear me? That? Okay, here I am. So, yeah, so I got most of the question you're saying, so I got most of it and the question was, was um, are, are, are these subnational actors, does it complicate things for, for us as we're trying to, is, 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 is we're trying to sort of conduct foreign policy? I don't, from my perspective, and I think from, and as, easy, as and we've seen actually the increased involvement of them in foreign affairs in some ways, I never found it, complicated. I never found, I only found it enhancing, actually. Um, and there is a great deal of work that went into making sure that things are coordinated in some senses, because you, and it's really just about building relationships. You know, it's about the State Department building relationships with the different mayors and also county officials who are also very active on that front. I mean, you know, and I think that when we're seeing, um, where we're seeing mayors and state legislators, I mean, you have, I mean, what, what is pretty amazing is that when you look at it, um, you know, over time is that because there are issues of trade, for example, there are some things that impact these cities directly that is not always seen or known. You know, how does this trade agreement like impact us here in LA? How are we, how are we, how are we creating jobs here, here in Los Angeles, for example? So I found it as an opportunity to continue to promote and project sort of who we are on the world stage, but also, um, you know, if for example, if Mayor Garcetti is going to be going to China on a trade delegation, I don't see, you know, and sort of in sort of promoting the principles that we would otherwise be be promoting and helping to sort of um, to sort of do that. I only found that something that was complementary to our effort to something that was sort of antagonistic or something that complicated them. Um, and I think that regardless, I mean, to your point about social media, um, you know, whichever way we want to look at it, like, because that you can communicate to a foreign public anywhere 
by virtue of a tweet, you know, tweet by foreign policy, like those messages are already getting to, um, to those publics. And so, you know, so there's no real way around it in terms of making sure that, you know, so we can either look at it and work together or we can look at it as something that we're just not going to. And our approach from the Obama administration was that, you know, our, um, you know, our, our mayors, you know, who are on the front line of some of the very issues that we would be promoting on the world stage, and that's climate change and it's trade, you know, are our biggest assets. And so it is part of, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, so to, to me, and, and also I think, it, you know, we had in the administration a very robust department that was specifically dedicated to those relationships on this national level. Um, so, you know, when we, when we're seeing the mayors of, cities in the major cities in the United States, you know, between here and in New York and, you know, in, in Washington, um, just sort of seeing what they're doing and coordinating with them and, and seeing what they sort of bring to bear in our uh, public diplomacy efforts to me is more complimentary and helpful. And, is, and to me, was like our, our greatest, uh, one of our greatest assets, I think, in help in, in, that, in, that, in that sense. I mean, it is interesting how rich and powerful cities have become. So if you think about, uh, let's say, LA, even just LA County, uh, or New York, for that matter, even bigger, you know, we're roughly 10 million in the county, bigger in the metro area. New York's, you know, probably at least 50% or even double that, depending on how you count. These are huge places. And compared to a lot of nations, you know, the median size, the median population of a UN member state is something like six, seven, eight yeah. million. So, you know, this is a nation state in its size yeah. and economically even bigger than, because we're very wealthy. 100%. And, and I think the biggest like indication or sort of like of illustration of how helpful it is, I think to have, to have it is, you know, what we're, I mean, what we're now sort of calling city diplomacy, right? Um, is seeing how it's played out during COVID-19. Um, I think by many accounts, you know, and, and as we're talking about how the world sees us, they have seen us sort of retreat from the world stage on this regard. And we're not, you know, the America that people sort of look to is the, the first to act that people come to in a crisis, those types of things is not sort of happened in this case because, you know, we have, you know, we've sort of withdrawn from the World Health Organization. So what, so what we've seen happen is that the cities, you know, the diplomats of the city have all banded together, not just here in the United States, but from around the world, around the globe to step in just sort of, you know, in a task force, for example, through C40, um, you know, their task force to sort of help we create a national coalition to combat like, you know, the greatest sort of public health emergency in like a century. <laughs> so it's, um, so I think that is just an example of the currency, so to speak, that has been gained over the years by the evolution of, of how, um, cities, diplomats, so to speak, have, have, have played on the international stage and how we're seeing how that's been actually been, I think, helpful at a time where we may not see leadership at the federal level. Um, so. Yeah, terrific. So let's turn to questions from the audience. There's quite a few and um, just been looking through them a little bit. Let me start with one that's really a kind of variation on what we were just discussing about cities and states and other other uh, non, you know, non Washington kind of approaches. Uh, and the question is really about what about when there's a direct conflict. So, um, so the questioner asks, uh, an example from the current administration is California's engagement with Canada over climate change regulation, which is contrary to President Trump's climate change policy. In fact, there's a lawsuit currently by the Trump administration against California on that. Um, so, you know, you spoke very positively about this development. Um, what happens when states and cities do something totally contrary to what the State Department or the president wants? I mean, I, I definitely think like, you know, and I don't want to sort of over romanticize it, but I, in, in the idea of it, but I do think that in that case, it does, there are challenges there. It's not always going to sort of work out in the way that I sort of explained it and experienced it. Um, but I just think that you're just pointing out one of the challenges. And I think the hope is that, um, you know, that people sort of people uh, that there was more sort of coordination on that end because I do think it's a challenge I mean I think it works if if everybody is united in their message and their goals and their aims if you can't always assume you know especially now where you know even if we're just talking about COVID how that 
it's handled very differently from different sort of Republican governors and Democratic governors, and even just sort of seeing how that plays on that level. So I think that, you know, the idea of how useful can it be is predicated on the assumption that the goals are the same and they're not always the same. So I think with all of these things, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Some, you know, in some areas, I think it's helpful. In some areas, I think it's it's a little bit more challenging. But I, but you know, and thank you for pointing that out because it's exactly right. Um, but when it does work that way, you know, it could sort of be one of our greatest assets. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, look, I, you know, I'm a Democrat, and I think like a lot of Democrats, uh, I don't certainly for myself in the past, uh, federalism wasn't an issue I got very interested in, and I didn't think the states should necessarily have a lot of autonomy. And over time, of course, like a lot of people on uh, kind of our side of things, we've rediscovered the virtues of federalism and and realized mm -hmm. it's kind of good sometimes, but it does create yeah. complexities. And and our you know our constitutional system is set up to sort of um, yeah not really answer those questions very well about exactly where the line is between what California can do and what Washington can do when there's a true conflict. We have answers, but they're not always great answers. No, and, it, and to be right, I mean, it is reflective of our, of, our, of our system and how it kind of functions. And in some ways it's, it is healthy and it's really, you know, it's, it reflects like, like I feel like why, why it, a lot of people around the world sort of like that about us, but on the other hand, you know, it, it's totally, um, like I said, reflective of the challenge of it. It's like, it's, there's a good aspect to it and there's the challenging aspect by people having, um, you know, some of those conflicts on that level. Right, okay, so switching gears. Uh, question is, how does the Peace Corps yeah, fit, fit into this topic? <laughs> uh, in other words, topic of public diplomacy, was it a success? So what about the Peace Corps or similar initiatives that have sometimes been proposed? Um, has the Peace Corps in, in Peace Corps in general? Yeah, the question is just how does the Peace Corps fit into this topic? So is the Peace Corps oh. just thinking about soft power and public diplomacy yeah. in general, sending Americans out in this way? Has that been a success for us? Yes, and I mean, it, that was sort of created under Kennedy. And so I think that was exactly, and his approach, I think, mirrored um, sort of what we've sort of seen in, in modern public diplomacy and diplomacy efforts is that, I mean, you know, that is also a, a great example of how we've been able to um, to showcase what our values are around the world. And that's what it, that's what public diplomacy is about is communication. And, and so, you know, when we think about, for example, and it's not just the Peace Corps, it's also like our foreign service officers who are on the ground. It's the, the, it's the families, it's, um, it is, you know, our civil servants. It's, it's, it's all of these people who sort of make up our diplomatic efforts because it's not just over at the State Department and to your point, I mean, we, we have people on the ground through the Peace Corps, we have people who are on the ground through USAID. Um, so it is a multi sort of, you know, um, sort of government effort in that respect. So I think that we sort of, um, that really, I think, you know, contributes to our public diplomacy efforts, to our soft power. It helps generate the soft power, and and um, and, and and so yeah. I mean, it, you're exactly right. I think that in, I'm such a fan of the Peace Corps, and we, you know, I had a you know a good opportunity to work directly with them and sort of showcase also what they're doing and their contributions. And um, and I just have the highest respect for for those who are sort of on the ground, who are in particularly in very challenging environments, and. And that I think has sort of, um, you know, been a lot of what we've seen with the Peace Corps and, and where many are also stationed. So um, hats off to them. <laughs> so next question, what are some opportunities to work in foreign policy slash public diplomacy in LA? And uh, this maybe will give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the interesting things yeah. you're doing now, which, um, you know, really run the gamut from traditional foreign policy to yeah. Okay, so are you? Can you hear me? Now we can. Karen, your connection seems a little unstable. I think you're back. Yeah. Am I back now? Okay. Apologies, I have no idea. Why I'm having such a, why, why, why at this particular moment I'm having problems. Um, so, um, so the question was, what are some public diplomacy things that we can be doing out here? And I think um, that, so, you know, we're in one of the largest cities. I think that there are opportunities to, to work in various aspects. There's the tech sector. I mean, you know, there are so many facets of, 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 
of international work that's going on here. And Cal, you obviously, this is your panel, but you also can speak to this as well as you're sort of plugged into a lot of different things, but there's a Pacific Council on, on Foreign Policy. There's also Truman. So there are a number of different organizations that are, that are based out here in Los Angeles that I have been able to sort of work directly with. And that has been really an exciting time for me to work, to work in, in terms of the work that's going on here. Um, I just think that there are different um, industries as well that is that are also doing sort of is, that also work on issues that intersect in this area. And I mentioned the sort of the technological field. I think there's a lot of opportunities there, and you know, and, and academically as well. And was that I, I can't see who the question was from, but was it a student, Cal? And it was Honestly, we know? We don't know. They just come we don't in. know. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I just assume. I mean, in USC obviously has its public diplomacy center. So, um, so I think even on the academic front, and I'll just make a plug for you know for for UCLA as well and USC and um, but in Cal, I mean, I think um, oh, and, and so for me, so those are the types of ways that I've been able to sort of work um, and stay abreast of the issues um, on on many on many fronts over here. Um, and was there another part of the question that I missed when I was frozen? <laughs> I was just encouraging you to maybe take a moment to talk about some of the things that you're doing personally now. So I know you're up to a lot of interesting things. Yes. So I do, you know, a little bit of consulting on some of these issues that we're sort of talking about. And, and also I consult um, on sort of social impact um, issues with and communications and strategic communications issues, some with the um, with the entertainment community. Um, speaking of, um, you know, and then, you know, and one of the things in Cal, you know, I talked a little bit about this was that one of the things that we're doing is like, how do we view, you know, how is what we're doing here communicate to the world who we are? And, you know, so in some ways, I think that there's this one project that, that I'm working on um, that is called the Zoom Where It Happens. And it really is about how you catalyze the, um, the American electorate ahead of the elections and really just in a, in a very um, sort of creative way to sort of engage. And I think that, you know, when you and I talked a little bit about it, Cal, it was like, how, this is also sort of a way where, you know, and we've, we've had some international inquiries as well. So it's like people seeing us using art and entertainment to sort of project who we are and also talk about civic engagement issues and what that looks like from international communities. And so, um, so that's just basically the short of it. Um, and, um, but it's just very sort of interesting to sort of see to, and to continue a lot of this work here um, and also working with our mayor um, through his uh, the international organization that he is chair of called C40. And they are an international sort of organization that is working to um, create a national coalitions around combating climate change and, and inspiring meaningful climate action. So, um, so those, that's just another area where I'm also doing this work from, from, from where I sit. Great, great. Here in LA. There's a few more, um, quite, well, actually many more questions, but a few more I think we'll be able to get to. So you mentioned uh, USC's program and nicely yeah. mentioned UCLA. <laughs> question kind of follows suit. So the uh, question is how will presidents, President Trump's attacks on higher education and international education impact American higher education's role in American soft power. And just to kind of make that concrete, one of the things that's really unusual about American higher education is that we have enormous numbers of foreign students, especially mm -hmm. Chinese students coming in to American universities, certainly true yeah. for UCLA, uh, even more true for USC. And those numbers have kind of fallen off a cliff for a number yeah. of reasons, some of which have nothing to do with Trump directly, uh, but some of them are definitely directly related to Trump administration policy. So, mm -hmm. so either way, we're going to see many fewer foreign students coming here. Um, yeah. so, um, so is this a problem for soft power? Well, I, I, I definitely think it's a problem for soft power. I think historically we've seen the contributions of having international students come to study on our campuses. I mean, it's, it's been, um, you know, as one of the greatest sort of instruments of our soft power, I think. And I think that there are, you know, efforts to sort of limit that um, and, and prevent that as if, you know, uh, international students do not sort of provide, because, you know, it, in some ways they come here to learn, but also the things that we also learn from the students 
Um, and, and the exchange of the ideas only makes us strong, stronger, I think, as a country. And I think that's something that we have understood throughout history. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, you're pointing out something that is that is very sort of concerning. And then I'm hoping that, um, you know, I think with, uh, you know, with the Biden administration could sort of, re you know, reverse course on it. And of course, we've got the, the challenge of COVID and, and things of that nature that may challenge things. But as a general matter, and as a general principle, um, you know, it, it has affected our soft power and it's something historically that I think as a country that we have been very supportive of and have found um, very it, it sort of instrumental to our efforts in, in generating soft power for sure. Yeah, I certainly agree. And I think a lot of foreign leaders uh, have spent time in the United States. I, I think even Xi Jinping spent time in- mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. There. Yep. Uh, and I think that's a really, really, underappreciated factor uh, in getting American political life and American culture to be understood abroad in a way that I think ultimately is beneficial for us. Obviously, sometimes it's not. Um, you know, I've, I've heard reports increasingly of Chinese students, for example, who, you know, I think by and large tend to be fairly nationalist, mm -hmm. uh, coming to the United States and in some cases coming back feeling like, oh, this place is a disaster or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in general, historically, it's ran the other direction and it's worked. Yeah. It's, it's a good thing for all the reasons you gave, but it's also an important piece of our larger kind of public diplomacy puzzle. No, it is. I mean, and, and if you want to sort of, you know, and broaden that and also sort of look at it in the context of like, similarly to our sort of sports exchanges, our cultural exchanges, our, you know, you know, our, you know, like talking about music and our musicians that have studied abroad. And, and so I, I would sort of liken that to a lot of those um, kind of, cultural efforts as well that really sort of communicate a lot about our culture and who we are, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that will turn around. Obviously at UCLA, we, um, I think we really value those students and we hope they keep coming. And right now with COVID, who knows? Um, okay, so next question. Yeah. Uh, this is one's also pretty timely. Uh, how does the US's race issues in general, and especially right now, impact our soft power perceptions, et cetera? Um, and I'll just note, this is the questioner is asking about this, maybe the situation right now, um, but American race relations as a foreign policy issue actually go way back. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something that was, uh, was really an issue. Uh, the Soviets, you know, immediately uh, after World War II were, were beating up on the United States, in many cases appropriately, uh, for the persistence of Jim Crow and the State Department was concerned about it back then. Uh, how would this how would this hurt us in the effort to attract, uh, let's say, newly independent countries in Africa when their ambassadors would come to the U.S. and D.C. was still you know a segregated city and so so this is not a new issue um, but okay. it's obviously one that's um, you know that's also timely so so what's your take on that? So I think that um, you know the world is watching us very. Uh -oh, okay. Um, not sure what that means, but let's just keep going. Okay, all right. Um, okay, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, so you're right, Cal. This issue has not been. This issue is not new, and I think that it was. You know, what has come to light is the long time and long sort of the underpinnings of the systemic racism that has given rise and manifested into ways that we've seen played out over the last like five or six months, um, or at least visibly, you know, I think that, um, and the way that it impacts us abroad is, I, is, you know, I think the world is watching us very closely how we're handling it as I mean, and on the one hand, we talk about, you know, democracy and freedom and human rights, and people are looking at us, well, you know, why are you preaching this to us in, on, on the world stage when, you know, you have things to work on in your own in your own yard. Um, so it does, I think, complicate things. And um, but I also think this is, you know, and just turning a little bit to to Joe Biden, is that you know, if you look at some of the things that he would plan to do if he's elected, is really talking about, um, you know, his foreign policy is really about um, renewing democracy on the home front, and that is to um, making sure that we are combating all the issues that led to the systemic racism and the systemic inequities that have been generated for hundreds of years and are still finding its place in, in, different, in different areas here at home. So it does, it does make, you know, it, it forces us to be a little bit better. And I think 
Um, you know, and I think it's actually in, in the way that I also look at it is it is a way of holding our holding us accountable as well. We don't have a perfect system. I don't know if we've ever claimed to. I think um, that the unique thing about it is that it does force us to a it holds a mirror to what we're doing and it forces it to be accountable and to make us better as a country so that we can then go to other countries and and continue to promote what our what we sort of feel our mutual shared interests shared interests are. So um, so on the one hand, it's a challenging, but I also think it presents an opportunity for us to really live up to the promise of America, the ideals that we've stood for, so that we can then um, sort of uh, talk about them and promote them um, authentically and, and in, in a way on the world stage. I agree with that. And I think one of the things that's given America a certain amount of, of, of strength and appeal around the world is the fact that we're, we're willing to uh, to show our dissent, to tolerate dissent, and to engage with it. Mm -hmm. and we do that and, and are kind of open about our imperfections and our attempt to improve upon them. I think ultimately that works to our benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there are many things that we need to work on. Uh, and so, but that's true of all countries. And so that's something that I think, it's not uniquely American, but I think we've tended to be pretty good mm -hmm. at that. Sure. So, so so we'll see how that continues to play yeah. out. Trump and his particular approach adds another dimension. But, um, but since we only have a couple of minutes left, let me let me close with one uh, kind of personal question. So this was, uh, what was a highlight of your time with the State Department, and what was an aspect of the job that you enjoyed the least? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I have to say that um, you know. I, looking back at my time at the State Department, I mean, I just, you know, as we're sitting here and talking about these things kind of in an intellectual way, which is, um, you know, just like, okay, here's what's happening at the State Department, here are the cuts and here's how it affects it. It's just, but really just giving to the human element of, of really who the State Department is made up of, of the Foreign Service officers. I just have so much respect for the work that they do you know, as political appointees there, you know, we could have, you know, they kept us from a lot of blunders is you have a people who have the institutional knowledge and the understanding of, of certain of everything, whether it was on an issue or just on the institution itself. So just a highlight of being around around people, especially if you do international work. Um, and this is, you know, which, which is, which is what I do and have done is just really an ideal environment to be there. So that's kind of like broadly, um, about about that, and then also, um, you know, I, I was fortunate also to work for very good bosses, so to speak, who um, you know demanded a lot, but were also just through their example about you know discussing and showcasing and just leading by example of how important diplomacy is and how um, in some ways we were all ambassadors in some way or form, and just looking at that, I think was inspiring on an issue standpoint. Um, I think that um, climate change, I think, you know, in, in this is sort of what I see a, a general thread through all the work that I've done is that if I'm working on something that I believe has some sort of impact on people on the ground, no matter if it's, and I believe all of us do in some way, some way of respect, it's that that is sort of what I feel um, very sort of good about. So just from an issue standpoint, I feel like climate change is one of them, you know, just watching the sort of you know, working sort of intricately on, you know, the communications and also outreach aspects for the Cuba, the, the normalization of Cuba policy. That was, you know, something that I um, was just really, really, really fortunate, I think, to sort of see up close and personal. I think that, um, you know, in terms of, of, of communicating what the State Department does to domestic publics, there was a, uh, there was a campaign called Engage America, um, where we really, sort of coordinated and tried to get the message about, you know, why foreign policy matters. And Secretary Kerry, you know, he had, you know, he used to say all the time that, you know, foreign policy is not so foreign. You know, what happens on our foreign shores has impact back here in the United States. And really working on Engage America, where we're plugging and trying to explain to people how the State Department's to, like work and efforts, you know, what we're doing abroad impacts you right here at home in terms of your security, in terms of your jobs. I mean, so, you know, and then, there's the you know the there's things that are on the multilateral front as well as you know the work that I was able to do every year around the UN General Assembly um, every single year um, you know with the secretaries of state and also when I was at the White House through principals at the White House and just to sort of see all the world can you know to see and prepare 
you know, as the world leaders convene at the same time every year at the UN General Assembly is just something so, um, something is, is just an experience that's unmatched. I just, you know, I'm a big nerd. What can I say? You know, I'm a bit international nerd. But that's, that's, that's what gets me going. <laughs> Well, that is an amazing time. It's actually happening now, except nobody, yeah. of course. Right, right. <laughs> it's a unique, unprecedented yeah. situation. Yeah. Well, Karen, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to do this, for talking with us. Uh, we will post, now the recording, something happened. We're not really sure what happened. Normally we put these up on YouTube. I think we still will, uh, but yeah. it may be truncated. Uh, but in any event, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, and I hope to see you our next session with uh, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. And Karen, thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate it.